Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's Career Chat, Navigating Gallery Representation with our guest, Heather Bindari. I'm Alicia Alex, Associate Director in Career and Professional Development. Um, before we get started, I just want to give some quick housekeeping notes. So we will be recording this session um, and it'll be available to students um, on the CPD website afterwards for viewing later um, or reviewing anything that you may have missed. Um, feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation. Please use the Q&A feature as much as possible, um, and we'll leave some time at the end to answer your questions. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Heather Bandari. Heather is an independent curator, co-founder of the project-based curatorial team and podcast The Remix, an adjunct lecturer at Brown University, and partner and program director of Art World Conference. The second edition of her book, Artwork, was published in October 2017. From 2000 to 2016, she was a director of Mixed Greens, a commercial gallery in Chelsea, where she curated well over 100 exhibitions while managing a roster of nearly two dozen emerging to mid-career artists. Welcome, Heather. We are so happy to have you speak today. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. I'm really excited to be here. And we were just talking about how it's really weird to be speaking into a void. So I'm trying to feel in you out there. And hopefully I'll be able to connect on some of this information. I have way more information than will fit into an hour. So I'm going to try to move really quickly. And I'm very open to questions whenever you have them. Um, but I might wait till the end to answer the majority. But if something comes up that you don't understand, or you want me to explain more, please, you're probably not the only one with that um, thought. So please let me know. So navigating gallery representation with Heather Bandari. I am going to assume that I'm going to assume that some of you just want to know how to get gallery representation and others of you maybe have had it or are starting to experience it or have been offered it potentially. So I'm gonna to try to cover it from a couple of different angles, but I'm gonna start sort of at the beginning. Um, <laughs> it's so funny, we were just talking about the noise, the bonk noise when someone can't forward and I just heard it myself. Um, but first, before I begin, I need to give you a disclaimer. And the disclaimer is that, you know, someone can come and give you all kinds of advice, but it's really gonna be the work that you create and your goals that are going to achieve success. Um, I'm going to give you a bunch of rules that I know, expectations that I've experienced, um, stories about things when things went wrong here and there. So I'm going to give you advice based on the most traditional path toward gallery representation and then traditionally speaking what gallery representation has been. This year has been full of a lot of change and so these things are shifting and I will mention that here and there throughout the presentation. So take this as one perspective on this path. And it's a very, very specific path. Um, the book that Alicia just mentioned, Artwork, uh, there's an artist named Fred Tomaselli who gives a quote in that book that I love. And he says something along the lines of, um, I wish I saw, you know, the history of art is a history of mavericks. That's more in the history of art that I love. Um, so what I'm going to do is encourage you to listen to what I'm saying and then decide what fits with your particular circumstance and then take it in whatever direction that makes sense for you. Because again, history of art is full of mavericks and people doing their own thing. So do whatever you want, but know what is what is expected on the other side so that when you're making a mistake, you're actually doing it on purpose. Um, so an overview, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what leads up to gallery representation, the courtship involved with it, and then expectations, and some of the things that are starting to change. So first I'm gonna introduce myself because everyone who talks to any students or alumni or anyone is giving advice to themselves. Um, so I want you to know my biases and like where I'm coming from. So you can also ask questions about any of this as well. That's me with my daughter in front of an Esperanza Cortez piece. Um, I began my career in the arts with an MFA in painting. So I was entering this world thinking that gallery representation was the thing that I was going to do. I was gonna go down that path and that's where I was gonna be. I got a job in a gallery mainly because I needed money. So I started working at Sonnebend Gallery, which showed a lot of artists that I knew from you know, art history books. I worked at Lehman Maupin Gallery, which showed at the time more emerging artists that were still well above my career level, but closer than Sonnebend. And there were only one, it was only one gallery, not worldwide galleries. Um, and then I moved to a place that I felt very happy and very comfortable. And that was Mixed Greens Gallery there. And I was there for 15 years. Um, we were a gallery that um, 
it started in 1999. We did the thing that is the opposite of what everyone else did. We started online in 1999 and we were putting artworks online then. We did not represent anyone at the time. So I came into this world looking at really traditional gallery representation and then went into this place where we didn't represent anyone. We were trying to get the word out to as many people as possible, trying to make the experience of seeing art as democratic as possible. But what's the funny thing that happened was that this was our office where we did all kinds of internet-y things, um, was that the artists were the ones who came to us and said, hey, could you guys just represent us? And so we could have regular shows every two years. All this stuff you're doing is really interesting and exciting, but we want the shows every two years. We want the consistency. We want the long-term relationship, all of that. So we sort of morphed. We, we didn't give up our online entity. We didn't give up any of that, that forward thinking stuff that we were doing at the time, but we did move into this space that looks like stormtroopers lived there. <laughs> it was a very traditional gallery. Um, when we ended, it was 18 artists. So, and when it started, they were more my peers, my age. When it ended 15 years later, they were more mid-career artists because I was also older. So I think that's something to note for everyone that a lot of times the easiest way into this path is with people who are beginning or at the same career stage as you. So whether that is more mid-career or beginning, it's kind of that, that peer group is what moves together a lot of times. Um, I showed everything from really traditional work, which is, you know, paintings and sculptures like Joseph Smolinski to much more um, uh, less saleable work, I'll put it that way, like Jenna Spivak, who grew things as microgreens under furniture in her Brooklyn apartment. And this show was all about how anyone could be a farmer and it was about sustainable like food justice. Um, we also had a project room. This will play in later when I talk about the path toward representation. The project room was actually a window space. So one of our last, um, uh, last window projects was with Brendan Fernandez, where he painted the we move in the window before we were leaving and then had dancers dance in the windows at night. It was a really beautiful performance where they smeared the paint off onto their bodies. And then something else that's going to play later when I'm talking is that we did not have a shipping budget that was very substantial. So one of the reasons you might ask is like, why does this gallery only show artists in that area? That's so not forward thinking. They should be more global. It's like sometimes there are actually financial reasons why the gallery is like that. And for us, we could only show people that were U.S. based. And a lot of them were Brooklyn and New York based because of these financial limitations, because we wanted to be a good a representative of the artist. We'll talk about that later. So we had a peephole in our gallery. And through that peephole, you could see really um, ambitious site-specific installations by international artists. This, so this was Benoit Peep behind the peephole. And this was Travis Leroy Southworth who had a residency at the Hadron Collider in Switzerland. So instead of shipping a Hadron Collider <laughs> to a fake Hadron Collider to our gallery space in New York, we were able to send him a flat packed gallery that went in the mail, he assembled it, put his installation in, and then sent it back to us. That we could handle that kind of shipping. And we actually fooled a lot of people, inclu including reviewers who thought it was a live stream from Europe. Um, so you can think of creative solutions to some of these issues. We showed an art fairs, another gateway to representation. And then I moved to a nonprofit called Snack Melon when mixed screens closed. Snack Melon was entirely different. We didn't represent anyone. So I've seen the way the way I've worked with um, long-term goals in mind. And then this other way that has short-term um, short term success in mind. Of course, I'm thinking about, I was thinking about Jared's long-term success and his long-term career, but my role in his career was very limited. It was that, those two months. Whereas at Mixed Screens, I was thinking about all the way to their retirement. So that's where a representation has maybe um, a positive aspect. Um, and we'll talk about some of the negative aspects as well. Now I'm obsessed with um, financial planning for artists and business and financial services for artists. And I'm also involved in all these other things. And Alicia mentioned some of them. We're not going to talk about them. This book is also probably the reason I'm here. Um, so let's talk about the art world. The art world, there are many art worlds. So this is also part of the disclaimer. I'm still on the disclaimer, if you can believe it. The art world, many, many art worlds, you have to decide which art world you're a part of. The art world that I'm talking about is this very narrow focused art world where you go to a gallery, they're free to get in, but they're seemingly in a lot of cases, it's expensive to actually gain access to buying some things. 
Um, but they range all the way from some artist run spaces to the Hauser and Worth and the Zwerners of the world. But that is an art world that's mainly that's written about in arts publications that's known about by a pretty small community. Um, there's this art world that I'm not talking about, though. <laughs> this is the art world that's mainly about money. So we're going to talk a little bit about success. Like this is an art world that some of you might actually want to be in, and that is fine. And gallery representation is actually the path toward this art world, this Damien Hirst auction art world. Um, but I want to point out something really important <laughs> that artists, when you're thinking about representation and you're thinking about where, what's your place in this world, in this whole big art world and the many art worlds, that artists are at the center of most of it and that you have power. Because I think that gets lost in a lot of discussions of representation because all of a sudden, I, a lot of people think, you know, you're handing over your career to this place that's going to take care of you. They're going to, you know, um, manage things for you. They're going to bring opportunities to you but you're actually the center and they're just one way that you get your work out into the world. So I want everyone to remember that. There's some Wangenshi Mutu quote that's along the lines of, you know, where the, we are the food, like where what makes everyone, everyone thrive and everyone survive. So as you can see in this really crude um, little diagram that I made, um, artists have direct contact with lot, have potential direct contact with a lot of people, critics and curators and the nonprofit galleries and the collectors and the commercial galleries. Sometimes when you're represented though, a lot of this, a lot of these connections start to filter through the gallery. So that is one thing that you might be giving up when you, when you join a gallery as a represented artist. But remember over here, this other art worlds, right? Um, think about that too, that make sure that well, it depends on what your goals are, but if I were you, I would make sure that this commercial gallery connection does not cut off some of these other connections for you. So this is your diversifying your, your um, venues, your ways of getting out into the world by having representation. So I want to just briefly, we're not going to do goal setting because I can't even see you, but I want to talk about how you need to do goal setting before you put any of this advice into practice. This is a Fritz Chestnut. She's actually really happy. She was seeing a Justin Bieber concert. <laughs> he drew her face. Um, so goals. First, you're going to have to think about your values. If you haven't done this already, think about your values. What makes you, you? What makes you like move forward in the world with passion and um, excitement? right? What, what makes you different than everyone else? So these are, these are, this is something you should really think about. Think about at least five values you have that, that make you who you are. And then you have to think about how those values, those things that you carry with you every day, feed into your mission and purpose, like why you're doing the thing you're doing today, why you're doing the thing you're doing tomorrow. And then once you start thinking about that, you can also think forward toward your vision. Those are your goals. Those are things that are what you want to have happen in the future. If your values do not align with your vision, you're going to have problems and you're not going to be very happy later on. So I really want to come back to these values and thinking about um, um, how any gallery representation might fit into them. You also have to think about your community and your audience. Who is your community right now? Who's your audience and who do you want it to be? Galleries are very specific. There's a specific audience that comes into a lot of them and you have to do research on who actually goes to visit these places. Who's buying from these places? Who's showing the artists from these places? Is that the audience and the community that you want? Um, and you have to think about your defin definitions of success. Of course, it's fine to want to have money. And in fact, I would love for all of you to have lots of money because I'm guessing it would go back into the art world and we would all do better if we all had a little more money. However, there are lots of other ways of being successful and lots of other goals that you might have that don't have to do with money. Um, what I really want you to do is find out who you are and then do it on purpose, like Dolly Parton says. Um, and goals should be, and that you can go way more into this in my book and many other resources online, smart, a specific, measurable, achievable, realistic with a time frame, smart goals. So these are going to relate to all kinds of aspects of your life, but I want you to think specifically before you start thinking about representation to think about some of your goals for your art and your career. And now we can talk about some things I think you need to know when thinking about relationships with galleries. Number one is that there is a myth that once you get a gallery, you do not need a job anymore, like a day job anymore. And that is a huge myth. 
I want everyone to know, and I'm not saying this to make people feel bad or get discouraged because that is not what you should do. Instead, you have to think about how a lot of, a lot of artists, it gives you freedom to have other sources of income first off. And secondly, it takes a really long time to get to a place where you might be making 100% of your income from a gallery situation. And I would warn that if ever you are making 100% of your income from a gallery situation, you need to start to diversify. Because what might happen in this situation is that you might be backed into it. Why were you an artist to begin with? To make what you want to make, right? You might be backed into a corner to continue making the thing that sells. Um, so jobs actually offer a lot, of a lot of freedoms for artists. And most of the artists that you know as being very successful that are represented by galleries actually do have other streams of income. They might be lecturers, they might teach, they might have a product that they're also selling. There are lots of different things that they're doing that you might not consider to be other jobs, but they are other jobs. Um, number two, the submission thing is never gonna really end. <laughs> and while people say, that, you know, no blind, I'm sure you've all heard no blind submissions. You never want to walk into a gallery with a portfolio under your arm. Um, you're still going to be submitting cold to a lot of places all the way through your career. Even when you're a mid-career artist and a, a well-known artist, when you're a well-known artist, it's going to be easier to um, reach out to someone cold that you hadn't met before, but you will have done lots of research and they might already know your name. Earlier in your career, it's a little harder. You have to do the research. So we're going to talk about that in a second. No blind submissions. Um, so the two things, what are the active things you can be thinking about when you're looking toward gallery representation? The two things that you can actively be doing at all times is working in your studio, getting the work to a place where you're gonna be psyched to actually be represented by a gallery and show it. Um, and you're gonna be doing lots and lots of research. So we all know what the studio part looks like. The research part, oh, that's a lot of text. <laughs> the research part is a little bit more difficult. So I have this quote from Kevin Jankowski, who's also career services over at RISD. And I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but pretty much what he's saying is that what you need to start doing is looking at artist resumes of the places that you wanna show in. Your dream places where you would love to be represented or the places, even the places that are approaching you to be represented, look at all those artist resumes, see what they've done, what they're doing and what's upcoming. Is that the trajectory that you think you want to be on? Is that the trajectory that you could be on? Because of their, they're giving you roadmaps by looking at all these resumes as to how all the artists got there. It also helps you eliminate a lot of galleries that you might not be a good fit for. Because let's say you look up a gallery and every single artist um, is, went to RISD. It might, be, it might be harder if you didn't go to RISD. If you look up at the, uh, the resumes of all the artists that show in a specific gallery and 80% of them went to Art Center, then you've got a pretty good shot at getting them to pay attention to you. Um, so I quickly went down a research rabbit hole the other day, which I encourage all of you to do, where I, I mean, I have 20 years experience plus, unfortunately, age-wise, but um, in the art world. And uh, so I know places that I, I love that have open calls every once in a while. So I just looked last night and right now is the perfect time to be looking for open calls because everywhere I looked, there was one. So Smack Mellon has an open call right now for opportunities for site-specific proposals. That's the place that I used to work at in Brooklyn. The Q Foundation, also open call for curators and artists over there. And this is how galleries are gonna be looking at these places. These are nonprofits, but the, the commercial galleries are also looking at these places to see who's showing there. And a lot of press gets written about the nonprofits, which might draw, draw, your, draw their attention to you. Um, Field Projects is a gallery in New York also, open call right now. I looked last night, I was on my phone, you can see the screenshot and I was like, oh, this is another one I need to add to the presentation. Ortega Gasset is looking for two people for solo exhibitions right now. Then I was, I was like, let me branch out. So Tiger Strikes Asteroid is in, um, cities all around the country. One is in Los Angeles. They have an open call right now. And they're also much more accessible because it's an artist run space. And then I thought, how about California Arts Council, which you may or may not have a good opinion of. I don't know. But I started looking and this is the kind of rabbit hole that I encourage you to go down. I went to a source that I don't know very well. I looked at this second one that's a gallery 263, a call for art curated by Mark Dion. And I thought just based on the way it looked, it's probably a pay exhibition but I wanted to see, I clicked into that. I started to read about it. It was a pay exhibition, but kind of low. Then I was like, hmm, Mark Dion's a really interesting artist. What is the space like? 
then I, uh, then I discovered a space in Cambridge, Massachusetts that I think is really cool, that does a lot of community um, uh, programming and all kinds of stuff that I didn't know about before. If I had all the time in the world, I would have done this for you guys for five hours, but I did it for less than half an hour and I found a ton of stuff. So if you guys spent a day researching, you're gonna find a lot of different avenues potentially into places where galleries will look for you. Rivet is also an aggregator of lots of opportunities. It's, it's across the board what they're aggregating. It's rivet.es. Um, and then Creative Capital is a little more curated they have a really great um, artist opportunities with upcoming deadlines calendar. And then there was this article, just I think it was last week, I, if any of you guys saw this, about how artists run galleries in the Los Angeles area are defying the mega dealers. So this might be the time to actually be researching all of these new artist run spaces and uh, traditional artist run spaces that have been going on for a while and see what the opportunities are there because Los Angeles, as you can see by the New York, New York Times article, is is known currently as being a really good place for artist run spaces. Some of them represent and some of them don't. So what I'm encouraging you to do is really do a lot of soul searching throughout this research process. And you're thinking about four things also, when you look at a gallery and you're looking, it, whether you're already represented or not, you have to think about, is this space a good fit for me and a good fit for my work currently and potentially into the future? Is this a good context for me currently and into the future? Is this the right audience? I mentioned that already. And also you have to think about money because again, there's this myth that once you get represented, the money will just come in barrels and you'll be fine. Um, and that's not always the case. It takes several years in most cases for an artist to actually really make money based on the shows that they have because it takes a while for a gallery to develop the collector base to actually get you to a place where, where you will sell a, a significant portion of a show. So the gallery is taking a risk on you and you're taking a risk on the gallery. If you need money quickly and you need a stipend to make a show, a gallery is probably not the place that you're gonna find that. In the past, historically, some of the big galleries have given stipends to artists that are represented, but I would never recommend that to an artist these days because what happens is it's a debt. In the end, we have to think about it as debt and I'm very into financial planning for artists. And you, you already might have student debt, you don't want to add debt to a gallery on top of that because they're not going to be as straightforward. This isn't, you're not dealing with a bank anymore. You're dealing with some people who might not have any finance background. So let's not, let's not go there. Um, and lastly, number three, I want you to write everything down, whether or not you're represented. So here's my paperwork. <laughs> um, uh, the gallery, hopefully, will be keeping track of inventory in a system like this, something like an art base. Um, you can also be keeping track of your inventory. I'm not getting paid by Artwork Archive, but I really like them. And I think it's really an affordable, inexpensive, a really cool system. So you might want something like this, or you might just grab an Excel spreadsheet, but you wanna start keeping track of stuff too. Something and their contacts. You wanna start keeping track of your contacts also. And you wanna start asking the gallery when something sells, um, who bought it? And if people are coming in, who are they? Can I have their contact information? You might not reach out to them, but just have them have that information for the future. Because something that I learned really um, uh, deeply when mixed screens closed was that most of the artists we dealt with um, did not keep track of any of this while we represented them. And galleries don't last forever, right? There, it's not and even Yoda didn't last forever. I was just going to use Yoda as an example. <laughs> like you, you have to, you have to recognize that this long-term relationship that you're building together might not be as long as you thought. So when we were closing and we were very honest with our artists and very above board, um, thank God, I realized that none of them had kept it. And people were emailing me like, oh my God, oh my God, can you send me a spreadsheet? I don't have anything. I don't have any of my collectors. I don't have anything. I don't have any images from any of the shows I've done. And so we had a very long and thoughtful closing. Most people don't. So again, whether or not you're represented, I want you to keep track of consignment forms. I want you to write everything down with the galleries and the places that you're dealing with. And I also, if I were an artist, I would also ask to see a copy of the invoice when something sells, because I've heard quite a few stories about shady invoices. Um, so now we're going to get into a little bit more nitty gritty. I've already been talking for almost a half hour. So Artist gallery representation. We're not talking about artist run spaces because 
as much. I'm going to talk about this traditional commercial gallery space, um, not nonprofits. You can see that I really scratched out vanity galleries because I don't want you guys paying for shows. So if you run across something that says they're going to have this like commitment to you or whatever, but you only have to pay a thousand dollars for the show, just like scratch that off your list and move on. You don't have to pay to be represented. You don't have to pay to have an exhibition. Um, so again, we've talked about preparation this whole time. And I love this quote by John Baldessari, where he said something along the lines of, um, you're making the work you're, you're, making, you're making work so that your old work looks more interesting and you're giving context to your old work. That's why you have to keep making work. So this is hard. When you're waiting for a gallery to, um, to show you or to represent you, you have to keep doing. I know a lot of artists who are like, but that last body of work that I have is so amazing. That should be the show. They need to represent this work. Um, but that rarely happens. Usually it's you're making something else that they pay attention to. They see the older work. It all becomes, you know, one together under this one umbrella. And that is a really interesting group of work together. So uh, you should never really be waiting is what I'm trying to say. You need to be doing um, the entire time. You're thinking, <laughs> and then you need time. So when I was researching the book, a lot of gallerists said, you know, artists need to wait at least a year before they approach me. They need to know my program for at least a year. And what's funny is that up until this past year, I didn't really understand that in the same way that I now understand that. Because if you were researching, you started your research this time last year, if you just started, you know, um, uh, contacting people and going and you hadn't been following a gallery's trajectory for a while, this year has changed a lot. So for anyone researching now, I would, I would wait a little bit, like do your research, see what the past, what they did in the past, what they did during this past year of great distress and how they're coming out of that. Because again, gallery representation, representation is supposed to be long-term. That's the point of it, to be like collaborating and working as a team for the benefit of both parties. And so you wanna, you wanna give some time to that to really see if it's the right fit. I also interviewed people on how they found um, gallerists and I update this list every once in a while. And it's always, you don't have to pay attention to everything on this list, I can give it to Alicia too. But um, the most important parts are artist recommendation, curator recommendation, and an online presence. I think you have to really pay attention to those. Um, that's how a lot of these, these relationships happen. So really it's about your community. It's about the research and you reaching out, not just doing the research and holding it, but then doing something about it, trying to, trying to connect with those communities. And in this past year, it's been extremely difficult, but there are lots of ways to still do it um, online. Like I did, I did this really quickly um, because I think the way that I got to Alicia might have been because I knew Megan Miller from MICA, who knew Chris from Art Center, who knew Alicia, who knew me. That's um, Jonathan, who's the guy who wrote the book with me. And that's, of course, Kevin Bacon. Um, but I never would have known when I met Megan many years ago that I would be here today. And a lot of people who have been in the art world for a while can trace back uh, an opportunity through people. It's a lot of people along the way. And what you're doing is you're just talking about your work. In, in situations, this isn't like networking in the sleaziest form. This is like, I'm talking to people who I respect, who respect me, who I'm in school with, who are teaching me. You don't have to be in an elevator. And in fact, now you shouldn't be in an elevator with anyone talking because you'll get COVID. Um, you should have an online presence that lets people once they meet you, or hear about you actually delve more fully into it. That's what the internet supposedly looks like if you Google it. Um, and you're hustling, you're actually, you're talking about things, you're getting, you're getting the word out through those online channels in most cases right now, especially. And again, you're not waiting, you're doing stuff yourself. If no one's giving you an exhibition that you want right now, think about ways that you are um, organizing things on your own, especially if you're students, this is like the, this is the way to go. You've got the energy, you have the age on your side. You gotta, you gotta do things together to make a buzz about what you guys are doing. Cause you're, you're the future. And as I said, you're the center. And if anyone contacts you, you have to be prepared to follow up really quickly. That is key with a lot of gallery dealers because there are a lot of artists out there and there aren't enough galleries to show everyone. 
And so a gallery could be really interested in your work with what they're going to think. So a lot of times this power dynamic gets into people's heads, right? They think that the, the gallery has the power and they don't. And so when someone reaches out, sometimes they think, oh, they must not really mean it. They, they do mean it. If they're asking you for a studio visit or they're asking you to send your web address or they're asking you for, you send it. And what they're going to think if you don't send it right away is that you don't want to show there. You don't like them. There's a reason why you're not doing it or that you're going to be very difficult to work with one or the other. So you want to be able to send things really quickly and then you give it time because there's this whole courtship to, courtship involved. And I go through this in my book um, where I did a whole bunch of different images for courtship in case one of them resonates with you more closely than the rest. Um, and what the courtship normally involves is some sort of a studio visit first. And this can be online now. It does not have to be in person. So you don't have to be on hold with this. And in fact, right now, I think it's a lot easier to get studio visits with people than it was in the past because you can do a Zoom visit. That turns into some sort of maybe back room situation where you're in a flat file or you're in an office, your work, not you. <laughs> Um, then a group show, group exhibition. This is where I'm going to get into like financially speaking, this is where it starts to get more complicated. When you're in a group show, you might be asked, this is before representation, you might be asked to pay for shipping partway, or maybe they don't have insurance, or maybe they don't, they're not paying for shipping. You don't want to offer anything because you're so excited about the opportunity. Do not offer anything for free um, because the way you go into this relationship is the way it's going to be for a long time. It's going to be hard to take steps to rectify what you've set up in the beginning. So please, if they're saying they're not paying for shipping, ask if there's any budget for shipping. If they're saying there's no insurance, say for every show, is there no insurance or just for this show? Like ask some questions. Don't be annoying, but you can still, it's your right to ask questions and to see what you can get because I will, I'll guess that there's usually a budget for a lot of these things. It's just very small in some situations. And the person that asks gets it. So if they think you don't need it, that's going to be an impression they might have moving forward. Um, that might turn into a project space. This is when finances get a little more important. Um, this is where you should not be doing a lot of work for free for a gallery that's maybe potentially going to represent you in the future. Because again, the way you go in is the way it's going to stay. So like, for instance, with this project space that I ran, we gave a stipend to artists for the project because it was a commission, pretty much. Um, so there needed to be some sort of compensation in this case. If it had been a show in the back room, we might not have given anything like that, but we would have started to pay for shipping. Project space, this is getting, this is getting serious. Your courtship is getting serious. Um, art fairs, it's getting really serious because now you're out in public with them and not just the local public, you're out with like the international public. So I've heard a lot of stories about artists being asked by the gallery to pay for their shipping to an art fair, to pay for part of the booth. That's, that's probably not the gallery you want to be represented by. Just put that out there. Um, and then it turns to a solo show. If you're, if you're moving along this very traditional path, you can skip a bunch of these things, by the way, to get to the solo show. And it's either usually during or um, after the solo show that, um, that you're asked to be represented. And that's when they should be paying for things. Um, all along, the, way I, the reason I said like ask for things all the way along is that you want to be yourself and you want to present your actual situation to them. <laughs> You don't want to pretend to be something else so that then when things get really serious, it's, it is actually like dating a lot. Like you don't want to get into this like serious relationship and then wake up one day and be like, you're not who you said you were. It's, it's the same like both ways in this gallery um, relationship. And there are lots of expectations. So I'm going to go through some of these things to think about. Um, I'll split it up. Shipping is one that I've already discussed. A lot of times at the beginning of a relationship, they might pay one way. When you're represented, they should be paying both ways. Um, they should be investing in your future um, because they're gonna get 50-50. The split is gonna be 50-50. And upfront, early in the relationship, you wanna lay out the insurance situation. Maybe they don't have it, but maybe that's okay with you. But you need to know what the situation is. Um, you wanna lay out the discounts. Are they a gallery? They might be a gallery who never gives discounts. They might be a gallery that gives up to 40% discounts, which that's unheard of, but like 
20 might be normal for them. And you want to know that you want to know that every price that you're giving them is actually going to be a greatly discounted price when you receive it in your bank account. And you don't want to be disappointed. You want to be fully knowledgeable about the situation. And also, when are they paying you? Not being on the same page with these things on this page, on this slide, that's where all the problems come from that I've heard about most of them come from this. It comes from being on different pages when it comes to this and both sides assume something that is not correct. Um, then the other things that you wanna think about that aren't nearly as important as those, but still really important, like who's inviting people? Like who's the gallery when you're represented should be inviting their whole list. They should be really pushing, really marketing, maybe even advertising. They should be writing the press release. They should be sending it out to a lot of different press outlets. This doesn't mean you're not helping. You can help and you can be a team, but this is their responsibility. It's why they're getting the 50%. And are you able, to um, show with other galleries without letting them know. That's something that before representation might be unclear and you wanna really figure out. And then after representation, they're probably gonna wanna show you themselves. I'm gonna go back to, um, or, or have everything filtered through them. I'm gonna go back to press release for one second. More and more now I am seeing for represented artists or even unrepresented artists, but especially represented artists, really working um, more closely, especially if you're a BIPOC artist, working more closely with the gallery to craft press releases. It's not your responsibility. However, the way that they characterize your work is the way that is your work is going to be characterized by the outside world. And right now the language is important. So if you think the language is important with your work, I want you to get involved in that kind of um, decision-making and make sure that you have the opportunity to approve written materials like that that go out into the world. More paper. Um, other expectations that aren't gonna be written down, but we'll talk in one second about how some people are starting to write them down are open communication, attending their events, whether that's a Zoom event or an in-person event, um, just supporting, not just financially, but also just psychologically and emotionally being supportive of each other, um, positive energy and enthusiasm and respect. So this is two-way street for all of this. One thing that artists get really um, shocked by sometimes is that they're also expecting as the relationship gets more serious for you to share contacts. And that's something you've been building up yourself. They're your private contacts. Um, but a lot of times, I understand why they want you to do that. So I'll just tell you why, and then you can decide what you want to do. Um, it's because the people who have supported you throughout your life so far are going to be your biggest supporters and advocates in the beginning of any like gallery career. So utilizing those people, engaging those people, bringing those people in is actually really important in gaining buzz around your work and bringing more people in. Um, then it's after a, the beginning, it's their job to bring in all the new people and hopefully they're bringing in new people from the beginning. But the, the matter of fact is that your circle and your community is going to be the audience at the beginning that's going to be the most supportive of what's going on. So representation. I've already discussed most of this, so we can go quickly. Your job versus their job. You're making the work. Like really outside of that, you need to be a team player. And they need to be providing a lot of woo, they need to be providing a lot of the things that I just discussed. So bringing you know this the space potentially whether it's online or in person depending on the time, what's going on in the world, um, the press releases, the contact, like lots of other things they need to be bringing in. Um, let's see, uh, yeah, sales commissions and cooperation. They're expecting they're expecting you to help. So to be available, if they have a collector that wants to come to your studio, maybe not during COVID, but wants to come to your studio to talk to you or for you to come in and maybe do a walkthrough of your show. There are things like that that would be really helpful for them if you're willing to do it. They're also probably expecting exclusivity. I hope some of you guys have seen this new movie with Kristen Wiig. It's really funny. Um, uh, and then um, you're at this point when you're represented, there's no more selling out of your studio without their knowledge. And they're expecting you to tell them when other people approach you to buy your work. And I'll explain a little bit why. So what you can expect of them is organization and promotion. They should be, there should be putting your work out into the world in a way that you can't on your own, because otherwise you do it on your own. Um, advice as a manager and a dealer, um, being really clear and following through if they say they're going to pay you in 30 days, paying you in 30 days. I want to point this part out though, the complete disclosure. You're never going to hear every single lead that they have. 
because after working in a gallery for a really long time, both nonprofit and for profit, I know that there, there are potential leads all the time. It's like working in real estate or something where people are constantly like biting and nibbling and saying, oh, I'm really interested in that artist's work. The number of things that actually follow through, curators that actually curate the show, collectors that actually buy the work is a very small percentage of the number of nibbles that you get. And if I had reported every single nibble to each one of my artists, they would be severely disappointed all the time because they didn't sit in my seat listening to all the, the compliments and the this and that every day, and then recognizing that only a small percentage come through. But I could never, I could never anticipate which ones were going to go through and which ones weren't. So I waited until it got to, you know, a 90% it's going to happen until I told my artists. So they're going to tell you most, unless you're asking very specific questions, I'm not going to tell you all. Um, you're expecting solo exhibitions. You're expecting them to pay for show costs. You're expecting images and inventory lists that they're keeping track of everything in a really professional way. You're expecting to be represented at art fairs along with the other artists on the, on the roster. And they should facilitate your showing with other galleries. There is a lot of competition out there, but my philosophy on this is that, you know, we, we all do well if we if we're all doing well, we're all doing well, like we can all help each other. It's a community effort. And I think the last year has really focused that for a lot of galleries that were extraordinarily competitive before. We've recognized that when we work together, we all, we all do better. Um, and all of this stuff should be written down. I'm gonna wrap it up now. All of this should be written down. Um, and there are a couple things that I hope you can write down with a, rep with a representative, um, but I'm not sure if you can right now. And that is first right of refusal. That's if one of your collectors wants to sell the thing that they bought that's yours, that your gallery or you can be the first one to buy it. A lot of times there might be a distress sale from a collector that's bought something, like they really need money fast. You don't wanna see that on eBay. Instead, you want them to come to you first or to your gallery first to buy it back. So right of first refusal and also resale royalties. If a collector of yours is reselling work and making a huge profit, my mind is that it's because of you that they're making a really big profit and that you should share in that profit. Contracts do not have to be evil. They can actually, you can actually advocate for yourself in them. There's a show up right now at Chuchi Fritos in, um, in New York that you might want to look into if you're really into contracts like I am. And they are actually trying to draft contracts that aren't just about the laws, but about feelings and realities. And maybe a lawyer is going to look at these contracts and laugh but an artist and a gallery are, can together write down something, write down expectations that are more human than what we were just talking about. Um, there's also an artist um, named Alex Strada who in her, when she sells something and she's told her gallery that this is the way they've got to do it, she says that the, the, the collector has to sell it in 10 years and they have to reinvest the money. They don't have to give it back to her, but they need to buy another female artist who's younger than her. And so this is a, it's a philosophy. It's not just about the law. This is a philosophy. And there are young curators like Destiny Ross Sutton, who have recently written into contracts with artists and, and invoices with collectors that the collector cannot sell the work for at least five to 10 years. And that when they do, they have to give the resale royalty to the artist. Again, this isn't necessarily backed up by a lot of laws at this point, except more in California, but still pretty shady. Um, it's more about a social contract that once you agree to this and you say you've read it and you agree that you're going to follow through and that our, the community will hold you accountable. So we're seeing a lot of movement in this direction over the last year. So how you're dealing with galleries is going to, ch is, is changing and some good things must come to an end. We'll, so we'll end on this. It might be you, it might be them, but this is why you're keeping track of all this stuff along the way. They're going to relieve a lot of pressure from you with the paperwork for sure but you can't lose track of it in the process. And it all comes down to communication and common sense. Any of the problems that I've seen between artists and gallery representation usually come down to a lack of communication. So if you're writing things down, that's amazing. If you're talking to them on a regular basis, that's amazing, that's half the battle because you're actually asking them questions, they're hearing how you're doing. And honestly, a lot of, a lot of um, us, problems are solved in that, in that way, that very simple human way. And my final advice is that when opportunities come your way, this Charles Long told me this when I was researching for the book a long time ago, and I think about it all the time, 
maybe there's a gallery representation situation where the money might be good. You, you know, because you've talked to other artists in advance of agreeing to representation and you know that you're going to be selling things great. But if you can't answer yes to one more of these questions, then there might be a problem. Um, if you feel sick in the pit of your stomach when someone asks you to do a show with them or they ask for representation, you probably shouldn't do it. Um, but then, of course, there's the other side where you're going to answer yes to all three and it's going to be the most exciting day of your life. Um, so there's all my contact information in case anyone wants to be in touch, but I would love to answer questions if anyone has them. I'm going to stop the share. Thank you so much, Heather. That was amazing and so insightful. Um, students, please do put your questions in the q and I see some popping up and I'll post some links um, to some of the things that you shared in the chat. Oh, great, great. Um, so I see the first, I'll answer them in order because I'm, I can't, I'm not good at multitasking. <laughs> um, do you feel like online Zoom studio visits are going to be here to stay? Yes, I do. I really, really do, because even from from my perspective, so I don't make artwork anymore, but I do do a lot of studio visits still um, for all different kinds of projects. And it's easier for me too. it's like I don't have to travel. So there are there are a lot of studio visits that I can say yes to now that I could never have said yes to before. So it's not I obviously I want to be in person with someone 100 percent. It's definitely better. 100 percent. I'm not lying about that. But it's it's between um, I get to see you in person, maybe, or I definitely get to see you on Zoom. So I think that a lot of people are gonna they're gonna continue to um, do this. And people were doing this before, like internationally, or if geography was too great, like they were doing it before. So this isn't a, a totally new thing, by the way. Um, do you have something to add, Alicia? Sorry, I'm still on mute. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I was going to say that's something that we've just seen across the board that some of the pivots that have been made now are just going to continue. And I think that virtual aspect, like even outside of just the studio visit is going to be such a big component and is like such a plus to connecting across. I know. And I was going to say, I don't know if it's positive or negative necessarily, but that whole project space thing that I talked about, like they, it always had to be physical before, but now people are activating windows in a way that they didn't before. But I also now see these uh, lots of galleries saying, oh, and so-and-so is also in our online viewing room. And so now there's, there is def there are definitely more points of promotion that can happen when you're dealing with a gallery, which will, which hopefully will make more artists, um, be able to be represented in that way, um, hopefully. But um, do you see, what is the next question? Do you see galleries changing after COVID with galleries or online virtual tours? Yeah, I think so. I think just the, the access in general and I'm, access in general is gonna be better. I think like I've also been able to attend openings that I wouldn't have attended otherwise through Zoom. I don't think they're not the same conversations though. So I think it's, again, just like the studio visits, if I can ever go back in person to an opening or to an exhibition, I want to do that. But while cooking dinner, I can also attend an opening that I never would have because I had to cook dinner for my family. Um, so, so I think there's going to be, there are going to be different kinds of interaction. I thought the question was going to be, oh, wait, let's just keep going. Could you touch on blind submissions and what is the best way to submit work to a gallery? So again, like never blind, they're actually really research submissions. And there are so many online that you can, that are actually asking you to submit. Um, but then there are a lot that aren't. And in those cases, I think the best path has traditionally been getting an artist to recommend you to that gallery. So um, how do you do that? If you don't know an artist who shows at that gallery, if you know an artist who shows at the, that gallery, they're, they're by far the best recommendation. I can tell you why, because artists don't usually, funny enough, they're the most generous people in the world. I think artists are gener generous, like community-minded and all of that, but they don't use up their favors um, willy-nilly. So any artist recommendation that I have ever gotten over the years has been a very considered recommendation of someone that they really think fits. So if you have an artist friend or a friend of a friend who can give that recommendation to the gallery, they're going to take it very seriously. Um, and if you don't know those people, I would I never recommend for you to do um, do something in order to get something like that's that's never my advice. But I do think just in your life in general, 
reaching out to the people you respect who you like. The reason you probably like a gallery is because you love a lot of the artists that show there. So if you love a lot of the artists that show there, why not try to do a studio visit with them? Why not like DM them on Instagram and say how much you like their work? Why not like strike up conversations? I've known lots of artists who have made friends by commenting on Instagram and asking to do a studio visit. Like there, there are ways to get into different communities that um, are much easier than you think. Um, and if it's not working at all, no matter how hard you try, it might be the wrong, the wrong angle. It might be the wrong community. It might be the wrong gallery. So, um, and a lot of this takes a lot of time. So I'm not saying this is a quick thing. Um, how do studio visits happen? Like, how can I get studio visits? <laughs> so that's mainly just, a, it's asking. Like as with other, and you start with other artists. You start with the people you know. When I teach professional practice, I always have the artists in my class um, reach out to their non-art friends and ask them for studio visits. And then also reach out to someone they respect who has never done a studio visit with them that's an, also an art person because it's a ripple effect. When you're young, it seems so small and it seems so hard, but as you live in this world for longer and longer, <laughs> you realize that it's, it's smaller than you think and you have more power than you think and people might be really interested in your work. So like, why not? The worst thing that can happen is someone doesn't respond to your email, literally. Like, so you just reach out slowly, but surely you're gonna find people who care. Um, okay, tips. How best in relationship with the gallery so it doesn't damage your reputation. Uh, oh, best end or I missed the end word. That was the most important word. <laughs> um, so communication. It's all about communication. So I, I think people, I've seen people break up with galleries um, really beautifully where you're, you're just respectful. You're respectful of what's happened and you tell them why usually I would imagine we can't talk to each other, but I would imagine the reasons are because it's not a good fit, whether it's not a good financial fit, it's not a good context fit. If it's not a good personality fit, then you think of, you think of a reason why you can respectfully and gracefully back out of it. Um, if there's money involved that people are owed money, that's going to be a lot more difficult to sort through. But in most cases, it's just, uh, it's about talking about it and laying out a plan as to how the relationship will end. You know, this will be the last time we do this. This is the last time we do this. The, the ones where you ruin your repu reputation and people start talking is when someone just in a fit of rage <laughs> goes in and says, this is over and give me back my work. Or there's a lawsuit after, before a conversation. Um, just, I, I would just recommend speaking and communicating as best as possible. Um, do you recommend retaining an attorney as an artist? I recommend always, most of the time things don't go south. So if we all hear the really bad stories, um, but most of the time things don't go south if there's the communication and if everything is written down. So I would always recommend you have a lawyer look at anything you sign or a lawyer look at anything you're sending to someone to sign to make sure you've thought through everything you're supposed to think through. Um, so that's for sure. Um, I don't think you have to like retain a lawyer over the long term to do that. I think getting a friend who's a lawyer or a friend of a friend or volunteer lawyers for the arts will do that. Well, will do that for you at the very least, if you cannot afford it and you don't qualify for volunteer lawyers for the arts, I would start looking up, asking fellow artist friends, what they've signed and what it looks like. Um, I would Google search the heck out of it and try to see what you see in the back of my artwork book. I do have a bunch of forms that you can look at, but you have to, you have to edit them to your own specific situation. Um, is paying for more art calls the norm. Uh, so it's like what I said in the research part. I think that if you see that there is a for a pay open call, you have to really dig deep on that. You don't just do it. Um, even if you like the space, you don't just do it. You have to research the space. There's, there are a lot of things you should know. Like, and one is that Submittable, which a lot of these galleries do the open calls on, Submittable charges them money. So, um, and I can't remember how much it is, but I'm gonna say it could be as high as like $10 per submission. So um, don't quote me on that, but I think it's something like that. Um, so, so if you're talking about a nonprofit gallery that is like running on grants and really scrappy, 
and they're doing an open call, even if they have the best intentions and they want it to be the most accessible open call in the world, they might not have the cash to actually set this up and to administrate the open call. So there are times if I research and I, I recognize it's a nonprofit that I like that's doing these great things for the community, but there's money attached to the open call, I know where the money's going. I know the money's going back into programming, it's going into staff, which I think over the past year we've all recognized staff is really important, workers are really important. So, um, so you know where it's going. If it's a gallery where the, the, the open call amount is a lot, and they're giving out all these prizes, and they're doing, there's like sketchy parts to it, um, they're, maybe they're not a nonprofit, um, then I would have, I would maybe, I would maybe not do it unless there are jurors on that open call that there is no way, no way you will ever get to them any other way. And even the chance of them actually calling you after is pretty slim, but it's a shot in the dark. Like there, there are reasons why you might do it anyway, but in general, if it's not a nonprofit where you can see where the money is going, I would just avoid them. There's enough stuff out there that's free or low cost. Um, do you see galleries been changing in terms of illustrative representation of gallery work? Um, the decline that place in the same level. So I feel like everything is sort of out the window in the last few years. <laughs> like, I think that's true. That was totally true. Illustrated work, same with craft, same with like ceramics. In the past, there are a lot of galleries that would not have shown that work. Um, I don't think that's the case anymore. And I also think we're, this, again, we're talking about different art worlds potentially. There, there are some huge galleries like, like Zwerner and stuff like enormous mega galleries that show ceramics right, that show more illustrative works. Um, but I think that, that it's, it's like slowly seeping in with people who are more multimedia in those situations. Um, but there are lots of galleries who would prefer to show illustrative work or prefer to show ceramics. So if you're looking at spaces where they don't show any of that, never have, you can maybe assume they never will. You can still ask for a studio visit and see what happens, what they say. But um, I think you're just looking in the wrong places. And it's slowly seeping into all these other places where it never would have before. Um, and then what are the most important things to do during studio visits? Oh, that's a good question too. Um, what I think is, I mean, you're, you're pretty much a studio visit is you're hosting someone, whether it's online or in person, you're hosting someone, right? So you wanna be gracious and you want them to respect you as well. So they should be respecting your space. You're respecting their time. They're respecting your time. All of that should happen. And during the studio visit, you wanna tell them all the things that they, they can't figure out on their own. <laughs> like this is the time where you can talk more. I mean, if your artist statement is really amazing, then maybe they got into the depths of your soul in your artist statement, but probably not from what I'm guessing. So, um, so you want to, you want to give them the story, what you are as a storyteller on a studio visit. So you want to bring them through like why you do what you do and why you're different than the other people that do things kind of like what you do. Um, those are the things I want to know on a studio visit because I can't read about it. I can't Google it. Um, that's why I'm there. And you're, what you're also doing on a studio visit, which no one really talks about, is you're sussing each other's personality out too, because it's not actually about the work in a lot of ways. It's also, it's about like, do we trust each other? Can we communicate well? Will we work really well together? You're like figuring that stuff out together so that that, because that, that gallery relation, I didn't even mention this, that a long-term gallery representation is a lot about personality actually too. Um, because if you're in a situation where every day feels hard working with them, you're not gonna wanna do it anymore. And if every day feels hard for them working with you, they're not gonna wanna do it anymore. So studio visits are the way that you kind of suss that out. Like, do we, do we get along? Do we click? Sometimes you can look past the personality barrier because there's something else that's like, really driving you or your work is so good they're going to look past the fact that they don't actually like you as a person um, but that's that's not advisable like you want to suss out the suss out the personality and also tell tell your story and in the best situation you're also asking questions of them so this is something that i found that doesn't happen a lot in studio visits is that i'm asking all the questions and then i leave and i'm like oh they don't know anything about the project i'm working on or like oh 
they don't know about the show that I was thinking about because they never asked me anything. And that's not, I won't like X them off my list because of it, but I recognize that like we could have maybe gotten along even better if they had asked me questions too. So those are the things that I would think about. It's so much like a first date. It is so yeah, much it is like a first date. It is. It's like you tell them about your family and like what happened. Yeah. That's true. Enough. Yeah. All right. Any other last questions? We're just about us at time. So many good questions. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Give us just a second for any remaining. Oh, there's chat stuff. I'm so bad at looking at all the windows. Lots of thank yous. Oh, thanks. Thank you guys for having, for having me come. And those were all really good questions. I hope I answered them to some degree. It is hard to look in this black <laughs> space, but I, yeah, thank you for coming thank and so asking. Much. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, and to all of our student attendees, if you have questions after this, or you go and you think about all of this and you want some career support, feel free to reach out to our office. Um, and if there are any questions you have for Heather, we can relay those as well. Um, I'll put some links in the chat for reaching out to our team, just to make sure you feel supported in this uh, area of content, especially if this is new content for you. Um, and I just want to say that um, one of the big regrets, I asked a lot of people when I was um, interviewing them for my books, like, what was a one regret you had? And everyone first says none, like, I never had any regrets, never, never. And then after a while, they would say, oh, I, I didn't keep my paperwork properly. That was like a big regret. But tangentially, another big regret that I never talk about is that people say I didn't take advantage of the opportunities and the career service and the career center at my school that I should have taken advantage of. So that's a huge regret of a lot of artists that are out in the world. So please take advantage of everything they have to offer. Thank you. Thank you for that plug. We did not. Yeah. Talk that. No, she didn't <laughs> tell me to say that. <laughs> thank you so much, Heather. And thank you, everyone, for attending. We hope we see you all soon. Have a great yeah. rest of the day. Bye.